Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of Ace on Music. I'm joined by my co-host Sean, as always, and behind the scenes we got Mark and Rachel handling the show. So, this week I wanted to talk about something that a lot of people ask me about because uh, they hear the term bantered around, but they don't really know what it means and how it's going to affect them. And that's this concept of dynamic ticket pricing. Everybody here who's gone to a concert knows the deal. You know, you go on to the website and you find, uh, usually they give you a range of, of pricing for tickets depending on how much you want to spend for a particular concert you're going to. Obviously the better seats cost more money and there's usually, I don't know, any, any number of, of levels. And that's what the ticket prices are when they go on sale on day one all the way through to the day that they that uh, the show is staged. But there's this concept of dynamic ticket pricing that really found its 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 true life in, in the airline industry. Anybody here who's bought an airline ticket knows that you go to the website to buy an airline ticket and the price for the ticket today might change within an hour, a day, a minute. It all depends on a lot of factors they have in there, how many tickets they have left on the flight, how, you know, uh, the, the, the time of year, obviously certain times of year people travel more. And so the price can change constantly depending on a number of factors. And the concert industry really wants to start using this model as well. And it's really started to manifest itself uh, a lot in the sporting avenue right now. I mean, the, the, the companies that do this, they've set out models where they take a lot of factors into play. Like, for example, if a specific team is going to play your local team and there's a, a very big rivalry between them, well, then obviously that's probably going to be better attended, so they can probably charge a little more for those tickets. Or if the team is not doing well or that particular show is... Um, or that particular event is not a, on a day that maybe conflicts with something else and they're having a, a lot of tickets left, they may drop the price on them so in order to encourage people to go. It even can be tied into things like if uh, a particular star is going to be at that particular game, like uh, if you had a basketball game with a LeBron James or a Michael Jordan or any of those people who who people really want to see play, well, obviously they can get more money for those tickets because the demand will be higher. Even down to things like the weather. If they know that, say, an open-air stadium the day before, the weather report says that it's going to rain and less people will be likely to go, then they may drop the price on the tickets to encourage people to come. So this model will start manifesting itself in the concert industry very soon. And <clears throat> we're going to start seeing... Things like you'll see the tickets go on sale. If the show is selling well, they might start escalating in price, or or if it's not doing well, they start de-escalating or you know dropping in price. Um, and this could work out both to the benefit and to the detriment of the fan. It all depends on your point of view. I mean, if you if this particular artist is somebody who you really want to see and from the moment the ticket goes on sale you want to get into that queue and buy your ticket well then you're going to pay the the initial offering price and if there's a huge demand immediately the computers may actually start jacking the price within moments of the tickets going on sale whereas if you are a patient person or somebody who wants to kind of do things at the last minute you might have a situation where a show is not selling as well so um, the tickets may start dropping in price as we get closer and closer to the show day because the promoter obviously would rather have uh, a full house at half the price of tickets than a you know a quarter of a house at the full price so this this is something that's going to become a, rea a part of our reality it's not even like it's up for debate like if this is going to happen it's going to happen and it's going to become the norm and so I just thought that it would be interesting for us to first of all discuss the concept of dynamic ticketing and then whether or not this is a good or a bad thing. So I know that you and I, Sean, have had this discussion off camera on a number of occasions. What what are your points of view on this whole thing? Well, there's good and bad, bad parts to this whole topic here. And uh, I, I actually hate the fact that this is going to probably happen. Mm. And, you know, and... You know, it, it, the good parts of it, it increases uh, revenue 
of course, you know, for the artists and bands and, you know, and, but there's going to be a lot of customer service issues. Of course, it's like, well, why should I go to see a show? And I paid a hundred dollars more than the guy that's sitting in front of me and I'm behind him, you know, it's going to be all that kind of stuff. And, you know, there's going to be ways around, people are going to figure out ways around it eventually. I think, you know, like for instance, I notice when, when we buy airline tickets, you get on the computer and you're like, oh, it's 290 bucks. And then my wife will get on the computer and she's looking at it in the, the room, uh, you know, next to us. And it jumps up 10 bucks because now all of a sudden two or three people are looking at it. That's exactly part of the, the model for dynamic ticket right. pricing. And then you don't buy it and then you wait a week and then it's down 100 bucks. What a pain in the butt, you know. It, it does set up an avenue for bargain hunters to have a, a good shot at it. and yeah. But, I mean, the argument that's being placed is that really the people who are going to get screwed on this are the people who are the hardest core fans of that particular artist because they're the ones who are going to want to go regardless. Right. And they're going to be in queue right away and buy the tickets. I mean, we, we, we've long since had the battle about Ticketmaster and various ticketing outlets and how they do it. Just... You know, we've talked a little bit about this on previous shows, but one of the things you need to understand that as a as an artist manager myself, when we decide to stage a concert, we decide, okay, you know, it's this size of a hall, it's this kind of an audience, we think that we want, we need to charge, you know, I don't know, say $30 for a ticket. And then you go to Ticketmaster and they add on their fee for right. for selling it because they obviously have to make money too right and then there's usually a facility fee on there which is supposedly goes towards renting the facility and all that sort of thing right there's service fees which is just you know you can you've seen the list of, of fees and then when you get down to it, it's like fifty dollars for the ticket right and and it's getting worse <laughs> the th I, w I will say this in ticket master's defense is that that is that is mostly on people like me mm. like we could go to ticketmaster and say just sell the tickets for 50 bucks and do it as an all in price but you know it's it's sticker shock you know when people see a ticket at $30 they go oh i, I can afford to do that and then you know they get all the service fees on and it's 50 they kind of go well they kind of grumble about it but they do it right. whereas if it's a $50 ticket out the gate they you know they may hesitate more right but the dynamic ticket, ticketing thing is going to change the game entirely. I mean, <clears throat> we're going to be in a situation where, you know, I, th I think about last uh, a couple of years ago, the last time Rolling Stones came around to L.A., um, Rolling Stones in the last 20 years or so, their ticket prices have been relatively high. I mean, it's they're one of the biggest bands in history. I get all that. But, I mean, the, the best seats in the house in some of these shows are in the four figures to get a you know you, you can pay thousands of dollars from Ticketmaster for one of these seats mm -hmm. and um i was dating this girl at the time and she really wanted to see them and on the day of the show we drove down to the arena and there was a line around the the block for the ticket office and i was like well what's going on here in today's day and age everybody has you know uh, tickets on their mobile Bar phones code. and all that. Well, what what yeah, are all these apps. people in line for right yeah. and it turned out that the so was the show was so undersold that they had decided on the day of the show to sell tickets for like seventy five dollars or something like that which was way below the the mark price yeah, yeah. and people were taking jumping on that bandwagon well that <clears throat> that sort of is excuse me an earlier version of what we're talking about but that would happen automatically they would see that coming that you know based on what other cities are selling for the same tour or that this band had done in this venue previously that we're not on track to to sell as many tickets as we did last time and what if we change the price by five dollars what happens mm -hmm. or what if we up it by ten dollars what happens because that's another part of this a formula that you have to understand and that is the perceived value sometimes people look at these tickets and they see a decent seat in the hall right and they say what Fifty dollars? That's what's what's wrong with this scenario? What's going on here? You know, and but whereas if it was a hundred or a hundred and fifty dollars, they go, oh, okay, that's worth it for that spot. You know? Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> well, the, yeah, the good part of well, there's not too many good parts of this dynamic ticket sailing, to and and on my opinion, but in my opinion, um, but you know, 
you can encourage adventurous buying behavior. You know, like you can you can have something kind of fun and challenging for the fans to, you know, like the band has like a you know a membership only, and you get your tickets, you know, with a certain price, and they won't fluctuate, and you know it, it can it can actually work for the the the. Um, you know, it can, and that, you know the other that. the other factor that you have to take into account here is that, you know, we we are of part of the sub species of of our society that loves going to concerts. We go to lots of them every year because mm -hmm. that's our thing. Yeah, and it is always in order for these tours to succeed, people have to be there. In order for the promoters to make money and continue putting on shows, people have to come to the show. You know, we're about to run into something that most people out there don't think about, and that is the post-COVID concert world that we're going to experience for the next mm, 12 to 24 months. Because what you have is all of these bands who wanted to tour in 2020 and in 2021 who had to cancel because of the pandemic, they're now all pushing their shows into 2022, in addition to the bands that have planned to tour in 2022. So you have this massive amount of talent that is going to be going and offered to the public at, gen in, at, at large in 2022. And, well, let's face it, you only got so many dollars in your pocket and there's only so many tickets you can buy. So the competition for the ticket dollar is going to be intense. And I think that dynamic ticketing is probably going to be quite the boon for people like us because there is going to be a lot of shows that normally would have sold better but um, are not going to sell as well as they as the promoters had hoped just because there's so much available out right, there. Right, right. So, do you think it's going to increase competition? Like if I want you to go see my band and I lower the price of the ticket just to get, you know, people to come see me. And then you like, well, then you lower your price of your ticket and to get people, you think that that's going to be an issue. Could right? very well. It could very well. I mean, yeah. these, the, the models, these computer models that they're building to create the dynamic ticketing is becoming more and more complex and taking in more and more factors all the time in order to, to try and anticipate the things that could be you know harming the the ticketing and all of that yeah there's there's other factors that the the general public doesn't think about either and that is for example you know in the last 20 30 years we've seen this trend where major venues have some kind of sponsorship like in los angeles we have the staples center which is sponsored by the uh the the office supply company staples and you know it has their name on that every time you see any band advertised it has, you know, it says Staples Center. So they get they get a tremendous amount out of it. They pay a tremendous amount for that. But in order to pay, to, to make that pay for them, they have a contract with uh, the, 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 the venue that says that in a 365-day year, they guarantee X number of events that will, you know, have the tag Staples Center so that Staples knows that they're going to get this amount of exposure and advertising. So, you know, there used to, there's this thing that a lot of people have heard about. It's a term called soft ticketing, which is where basically you're either giving tickets away to an event or you're, you're giving them at a massive discount, like two for ones. Or if you hear the ads, I know in, in LA, I used to hear the ads all the time where the Southern California Honda dealers would make deals that if you went in and got like your oil changed or something, they'd give you a ticket to the concert that night and you could go. Now, usually they were on the lawn and all that, but you were in the building and, and you were there for free. And so, you know, you get half the people there who didn't pay anything to get into the show. Mm -hmm. But that's important as far as the promoter and staples are involved because even though those people are there and they didn't pay, they're still getting bombarded with the advertising of staples, 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 staples. Right, right. So they're, you know, it, it works out for them. And, and that can also be taken of advantage by the fan because they have to put these shows on, even though maybe the, you know, they might, the promoters like Live Nation and AEG might put shows into certain venues that are larger than the particular act could justify simply because they know they have to make that 150 or whatever shows that they've promised the sponsor um, within the context of that. And there's a funny little side note, there's just one that I wanted to tell you about, and that is um, in... In, down in Texas, they have a venue called the Ice Palace. It's a, an arena that uh, 
that has shows, and it was sponsored by Smirnoff Vodka. Mm -hmm. But there is a there is a clause in their sponsorship deal that says that if the event that is being staged is targeted at an audience that is below the drinking age, like say you have Disney on ice or something like that, they're not allowed to refer to it as the Smirnoff Ice Palace in the really? advertising. Yep. <laughs> so. so I guess they don't want Disney playing around over there. <laughs> well, they don't want kids. You know, they don't want to be seen as advertising to kids. Right. You know, so that I makes know. sense. But, I mean, some of these sponsored venues have the strangest names just because of who's sponsoring them, you know, like the... Uh, 1-800-Flowers Arena. Oh, I, know. I remember when that started taking off Blockbuster uh, uh, Amphitheater and yep. stuff, and Verizon, and it's like, what What happened to the good old-fashioned names for these Oh, in, in England, where we, where I spend a lot of time, you know, before, uh, you know, when, when I'm normally doing my job, there is a cell phone company there called O2, and they sponsor a lot of mm -hmm. venues. So you have, like... Uh, the O2, O2, I mean, it's, it's just become, there's a, there's a whole chain of theaters, uh, you know, 1,500 to 3,000 seaters in England that are just known as the O2 academies. And there's, I don't know, eight or 10 of them or something like right, that. Right, right. So, but, uh, yeah. So are you in favor of this dynamic ticketing? I am in favor of it. If I put my manager hat on, I'm in favor of it because it is going to allow more people to come see my bands whether even if like because because you know there's a lot of ancillary income that comes from having a person walk through that door right if somebody goes to a concert even if you know let's say you bought a ticket for 50 and i bought a ticket for 25 mm -hmm. we're both going to the show we're both going to buy a beer we're both going to buy a pretzel probably right. buy a t-shirt right both going to park you know all of this is income that goes into the pot that wouldn't have happened if you didn't come or if i didn't come yeah. So the dynamic ticketing, uh, you know, tick, concert tickets are kind of like hotel rooms. And that is that if you have a hotel and you don't rent the room out tonight, well, that's revenue that you never can get back because the day is gone and time marches on. Right. Same with a concert. If I, if I have a concert that has capacity for 10,000 people and 8,000 come, that means that I lost potential of the income right, from right. 2,000 people. So if I can get those extra 2,000 people in the door, even at half the price, it's bonus money. Got you. So dynamic ticket pricing is is the way of the future because it makes sense on a business level on every level. Right. Well, there is statistics saying that uh, dynamic ticket pricing increases revenue by 25% versus the 10% that they used to make in the, the old way they used to do it. Exactly. For the airlines. Exactly. So it does it does help out, but let's hope it all goes to the artist, right? Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and you know, the dynamic... That's, that's the thing, is when Ticketmaster and all, they start cashing in on more money and, well, you know... On that front, the way it, it usually works for an artist is uh, when we make a deal with a promoter, mm -hmm. it usually says that, you know, the, when, when I get an offer on a concert from a promoter, they, they're very black and white. They say, okay... This is what it's going to cost us. It costs us this much to rent the hall. We have to pay employees this much. We have to have insurance. We're going to spend this much on advertising the show, blah, blah, blah. So at the end of the day, it's going to cost us this much. And then I go to them and I say, well, my band needs to have at least this amount of money to do the show. Okay. Like say it's $10,000 to do a show. I got you. So they add that to their cost, which is what the break even of a show is. Where they say, okay, and, and part of the expense, by the way, that they build into it is their profit because they have to make a living too. Of course. So at the end of the day, we have a break-even figure. And usually the way the deals are structured is it says that, okay, so let's say that it costs a hundred grand to put on a show when all is said and done. And then we say, okay, so if we have 10,000 people coming in to break even, you got to sell the tickets for $10 ten dollars a piece to make a hundred thousand dollars right mm. so but what if we said the tickets were twenty five dollars and um they figured out and they say okay well then on twenty five dollars we have the potential of earning quarter of a million dollars if we sold out and our expenses are this hundred thousand which means there's 150 left on the table and generally what we do thank you peter grant is we make a deal that says, okay, anything above the break-even 
the artist gets like 80 or 90 percent and the promoter gets 10 or 20 percent so it there is a, dy a dynamic factor that has been at play behind the scenes there already for as long as i've been in the business right right but that that extra money that's on the table that's pure profit for all people involved so for everybody involved the promoter the artist etc even the buildings uh it, it's it's um behooves them all in order to have that pot be bigger so going back to what we talked about a moment ago if there's a thousand people more that could have been in the venue that didn't because the tickets were maybe too expensive or whatever getting those extra thousand people in there even if it's for free just a is worthwhile because they're still going to park they're still going to buy right, the beer exactly. they're still going to buy the t-shirts and all that stuff so there's there's revenue there right so from a fan's point of view is it a good thing or a bad thing with dynamic ticketing well i'm not really sure i mean it, it all depends that's what it comes down to it depends on a lot of factors i mean you're going to be in a position as a fan where you're going to get some good deals from time to time you know where a show is underselling and suddenly you know oh well, I maybe wouldn't have gone to that show normally, but for thirty bucks, right? I, I could I could handle that, you know. But um, the 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 whole idea about the 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 hardcore being kind of taken advantage of here that's mitigated by the fan clubs that we've talked about and and um, that sort of thing. So that there are tickets being offered that way, you know. I I don't really get into this whole concept that some artists do where they they pull a block of tickets and then sell them through resale sites like StubHub and and eBay and things like that because and I understand the argument I mean they get pissed off when they see their tickets get snapped up and then show up on the on the for resale sites at a vastly inflated price and that money is not going to them it's not going to the promoter it's going to some yahoo in the middle of nowhere who just managed to hit the button faster than anybody else right and i get it but at, at the end of the day you're you're really still sticking it to the fan as far as i'm concerned because they're at the end of the day whether it's you or a scalper that's taking them for this inflated price it's still them getting taken for that's, an inflated, inflated price true. so very true but uh, anyway, so thanks for talking to me about this thing. I think it's going to become, well, I definitely know it's going to become the norm going forward, and it's just something we're going to have to live with. But uh, we'll see how well it works, huh? Yeah, and it, 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 it may have some positive benefits for us and uh, for, as far from a fan point of view, is, and it's definitely going to have benefits as far as the artist goes. So I want to uh, thank Sean again and, of course, Mark and the, his whole team <laughs> yeah I want to thank Sean for joining me on this conversation <laughs> I want to thank Sean for joining me in this conversation today and Mark and Rachel behind the scenes running the show and I want to thank all of you for your continued support. You can always contact us at acetalksmusic at gmail.com with your feedback or comments. And you can also leave comments right down here in whatever platform you're viewing this in, whether it's YouTube or Buzzsprout or whatever. We love to hear from you. We want to hear what you have to say. If you have ideas that you'd like to hear us talk about in other shows, we're open to that too. And in the meantime, stay safe.